Now Lebel to the right hand, puts her down. He's going to dump him hard to the ice. Brady Lebel just loves to fight. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome Warrior. My dream of being a professional hockey player became a reality, but it was all taken away from me in a very short period of time. For many years, hockey was my outlet. Hockey was my drug. When I had a stick in my hand, nothing else mattered. I was able to break into the Western Hockey League in 2004, and I even won the Swift Current Broncos Rookie of the Year. During the summer of my rookie year, I experimented with drugs for the first time. After just seven games in my sophomore season, I walked away from the Swift Current Broncos due to personal reasons. Nobody knew I had been sexually abused at the age of five. I did everything to hide it from everybody, but I just couldn't take it. Drugs and alcohol now took over my life. I did return to the Swift Current Broncos as a 19-year-old, but things were never the same. I was eventually traded to the Kelowna Rockets in my final year of junior where I got to play on a line with the Dallas Stars captain, Jamie Benn, and one of my best friends, the extremely talented Colin Long. It was by far my best season ever, and I even signed with the Tampa Bay Lightning's organization. A dream come true, right? That's when everything went wrong. First it was the cocaine, then came the Oxycontin, and that led me into a 12-year journey into the deepest pits of hell. Within two years, I had now made the switch to heroin, fentanyl, and everything in between and I was now an intravenous drug user. Multiple suicide attempts and over five trips to the psych ward, I was a shadow of who I once was. By 2014, I was homeless on Hastings in Vancouver, the worst street in North America. By 2015, I was a wanted criminal, making the Crime Stopper headlines more than once. After spending three years in jail, I had completely given up. With nowhere to turn, and nowhere to go, I finally started to get honest. I took a chance and made some major changes. This is my story. I overdosed over 10 times. I'm one of the lucky ones. And for that, I will always be grateful. This is for all the men and women we've lost. Matthew Wazinski, Mitch Fadden, this one's for you. My name's Brady Liebold, and I've been to hell and back. This is the road to recovery. I'm grateful, oh yeah, able, oh yeah, I'm stable, oh yeah. I'm what is going on? Oh yeah, you know me. Welcome. Hockey to hell and back, episode number 87. Proudly brought to you by my good friends at True Temper Hockey. I had a great chat with my buddy Cole earlier tonight, and... Uh, what an honor it is to be a part of the the true team and all that they've done for me and um, just a huge shout out to them. Um, they're even going to equip me with some red and black gloves for the Mustangs. I know my buddy Matt's happy to hear that. He's been bugging me for a while. He's like, you got to get those red and black gloves for the Mustangs. Let's get them going. This show is probably brought to you by True Temper Hockey, Puck Support. I'm Brady Liebold here in Muskoka. Had an awesome day. When I talk, I almost want to get emotional. Like, honestly, I don't know why. I had a really good day with my buddy Brody. I know he's watching. Hit the ODR. Feeling awesome. Excited about this show. Before I say anything else, I got to give a very special happy birthday to my man, my hero, my dad. He also sent me the copy of the paper. We got a couple more from our friend Stuart Smith as well, but happy birthday, dad, 62 years old and 34 of those years have been made pretty difficult by me. So, um, you know, I love you. Happy birthday. I miss you. I want to get home. I know you want to get out here. It'll happen soon, but, uh, very grateful to have you back in my life, dad. Happy, happy birthday. Um, before I go any further into the show, I always say that. Um, I got to give a special shout out to my friends, Hannah and Alex from House of Gemini, 
who are responsible for all the pictures of me, except for the one in the Tampa Bay Lightning jersey in this article. They're my friends here in Muskoka, Savage Badge Kids. Shout out to them um, for helping uh, make all of this happen. Um, yeah, there's not too much else that that I need to to get into right off the hop here. Um, I'm excited. Uh, I have another show this week. I'm going to be, I think, on Thursday. Don't quote me on that. Thursday, new time, though, during the day, either in the morning or the afternoon. I don't even know why I'm telling you because I don't have the time, but I'm excited. Two-time Stanley Cup champ, Chris Versteeg, uh, is going to join the show. I'm really excited to connect with Steve. Uh, played against him in the Western League. Uh, he's a hilarious guy. He's doing a lot of great stuff with his new app. Um, Two-time Stanley Cup champ. What more do you want? Uh, lo- really much looking forward to to that anyways i'm gonna shoot it over to team issued uh real quick shout out team issued jesse paradise he actually is sending myself and taylor the brand new khaki team issued track suit and uh can't wait to get my hands on that so let's hear from team issued we'll be back with jeff o'neill in a few moments Hi there, it's Regan Bartell, the play-by-play voice of the Kelowna Rockets, Brady Leopold's biggest fan. Team Issued is connecting all walks of life. Team Issued does this by recreating that special feeling of being a part of something bigger. A community for all striving towards the same goal. Teamissued.ca, promo code TOEDRAG15 for 15% off. Shout out to Regan Bartell, the voice of the Kelowna Rockets, my personal favorite in the business. I may be a little biased there, uh, and Jesse Paradise over there at Team Issue. But let's get to what you guys are all here for. He's here, the man, the myth, the legend. I'm sure he's probably not going to be like called and call, me calling him that. Uh, but before we get into it, I'll give you a little bit of background in case you guys didn't know. A lot of you know exactly who he is, uh, but some fun information about Jeff O'Dog O'Neill. Uh, originally from King City. Did you guys know that this guy played Junior A at 15? Not only did he play Junior A at 15, he recorded 80 points in 43 games, finishing second in the league and scoring that year as a 15-year-old, only before going on to the Guelph Storm of the Ontario Hockey League after being drafted. Yep, number one overall. Uh, had an unbelievable junior career. Gold medal at the World Junior Championships. He also is a a part of the prestigious 300 club that often doesn't get talked about in junior hockey. And I looked at his numbers. That means you scored 300 points in your career. Not many guys do it. He did it in only 188 games. It's unbelievable. 120 goals, 209 apples. Fifth overall pick by the Hartford Whalers. He's probably got that original jersey that everybody is just dying over in his house. Uh, We know he does. Um... This guy was a remarkable player in the, the National Hockey League. Multiple 30-goal campaigns, one forty-one goal season. You guys know him now from TSN. He's everywhere on TV, on the radio. He's the captain of the ship on that show in my eyes. I'm sure he's going to downplay that too. Uh, but ladies and gentlemen, originally from King City, Ontario, Jeff O'Dog O'Neill. Brady, how's it going, man? Good to be here with you. What is going on, man? Thanks so much for doing this. I, I honestly, I truly appreciate it. And something that, you know, I think has been in the back of my mind for a while is, is kind of on that, you know, maybe one day, maybe one day. And, uh, you know, two years into my journey, here we are. So I'm super grateful for your time. I'm a huge fan of you as a player uh, and, and what you do on TSN. You're a no bullshit guy. You tell it how it is. And, uh, you know, some people can take it. Some people may not like it, but uh, I believe the real hockey fan truly appreciates it. So thank you so much for being here. Yeah, thank you for having me. I think when you, you leave the NHL, you mentioned the no bullshit stuff. I think that, you know, we both played the game and we know what it's like to be criticized or people commentate on your play. <clears throat> and you just get to a point where you realize that you don't have to be a dick about it. You don't have to be personal about your comments. But instead, you know, if somebody makes a bad play, you got to say it's a bad play. Because I live in Canada, everyone's very hockey knowledgeable and – when they see a play, they know it's bad. There's no sense of sugarcoating it and saying it was an accident or too bad or whatever. You know, you got to kind of call it how it is. I try to do that anyway. 
Yeah. And I, and that's, I totally have so much respect for that. And, you know, I always tell people too, you know, people are so critical of players in, in, in situations, but hockey is a game of mistakes. If nobody makes a mistake, every game is zero, zero, right. It's a pretty boring game. And so um, there's going to be a ton of mistakes and uh, you guys just do a phenomenal job uh, on all platforms that you're on. And uh, we all appreciate over here. I really want to talk a little bit about your hockey journey early on and something that I kind of, you probably get asked a lot. I always kind of lead to that with uh, guests who are hockey players, you know, you're growing up uh, playing hockey and you obviously hit some tremendous levels early on to be recognized uh, to play junior A at 15. So walk us through, uh, you know, your life as a hockey player and the dream of, of being maybe one day an NHL player. Yeah, I, I think when I was young, I mean, you're 10 to 13 years old, you're kind of like you're just going out there and having fun with your buddies. Um, much like yourself, I grew up in a small town in Canada and it was just my two older brothers played hockey, and that was what you were going to do in the wintertime. That was kind of the passion of our family. My mom and dad, I don't know if they, you could say they love being in the rinks, but they, they always got us to hockey, and it was kind of just basically a part of our life. But I think when I was like 12 or 13, I, I mean, I didn't know at that time the NHL was going to be on the horizon for me, but I started to realize that I've got nine goals and all the other guys on the team have maybe one. So maybe, maybe I'm good at this and maybe something can happen from it. And my dad was very critical in, in me making it to the NHL because there was some decision-making along the way that he made and they probably could have backfired, but they ultimately turned out to be the right things. When I was 14, I was playing 13 or 14. I was playing peewee hockey. And after that season, my dad, said, you and your brother are going to play midget next year, which was jumping three three divisions ahead. And I was like, God, man, these guys got beards and they're killing each other out there. I just don't – I wasn't a very big guy. I mean, I am now, but I wasn't then. But I was like, I don't know if I want that. And it worked out well. I mean, I think me and my brother were 14 and 15, and we led the league in scoring. So that, that was the right decision. And then the year after that, it was Junior B, and I played Junior B and had success when I was 15. And then it's just everything was the next step. I got drafted to Guelph first overall, so I kind of had an idea. I was making a team. It was just what I could do with it after that. And I'm sure you can have an, uh, an understanding and an appreciation for this. I think when you leave your house at a young age, I think there's probably five or six guys that you can hang out with that can – maybe take you down a road you don't want to go down. And there's probably five or six guys that can probably help if you watch and learn from them that can take you to the promised land. And I'll be honest with you, I was probably kind of in between. I strayed off the tracks a little bit, but there was support and guys there to get me back on and realize that hockey was the most important thing. <clears throat> and then played three years in Guelph and made it to Hartford and had some great veterans there. And after that, just, uh, you know, moved down to Carolina, which was a different experience. The hockey market there was new there, and we were trying to teach them the game. And then I got the dream of uh, playing for the Toronto Maple Leafs. So it was, it was a great ride. And after I retired when I was 31, I kind of just disappeared down to Florida, and I didn't even really think about hockey. But you realize 31 is pretty young to retire and do nothing. So mm -hmm. and I came back to Toronto and just by accident kind of, did a couple phone in interviews with a buddy of mine, James Sabalski, mm -hmm. and it just ended up never leaving the radio studio. And then the TV people kind of sent some emails and you start doing that. And it's a fun career when you think about it. Like what, I mean, my wife bugs me sometimes that I'm always watching hockey games, but when you, when I take my headset off from work, that's kind of my job just to watch a couple games before I go to bed is you just see the highlights from other games. You kind of know what's going on. It's mm -hmm. like, it's just like a factory. You got to kind of wake up and figure out what's going on with all the teams and transactions and suspensions. And because when you do the work that I do, you got to talk about it and you got to form an opinion about it. So if you're not watching, you're not paying attention. You don't know what's going on. So it's a pretty fun job. It doesn't have the stress of, uh, you know, the pressure of selling something or meeting a quota. It's just you watch sports and you form opinions and you let them fly and see what happens after that. That's uh, yeah. It sounds like a, a pretty fun job. It seems like you guys have a great time doing it as well. And 
mean, there's a lot, there's a lot in there though. If we, you know, backtrack into that, I kind of, if you don't mind and anything that I bring up or anything you don't want to talk about, you just totally, you're, you're a pro man. You just deflect. But before I got to give a shout out to James Sobolski, because when I first started uh, this podcast almost two years ago it had a different name and uh sportsnet picked up a story and uh james actually called me and had me on his show and on the radio is one of the first people that that gave me an opportunity uh to kind of share my story on the radio which was really cool so very uh kind of full circle right yeah yeah he's um, a great guy yeah he was he was super awesome to me and uh yeah just awesome um i just think like you you talk about there in junior uh you know you could have went this way or, or that way uh, and you're leaning on that path like what was that experience like for you moving away from home especially being the first overall pick like Jeff like that's you have added pressure you have a target on your back was that more pressure for you uh, was it hard for you to move away from home uh, and and if you don't mind like how close could it have been maybe that you went down that other path if you don't mind talking about it a little bit yeah absolutely I'm from uh, like I said small town just just north of toronto so all my buddies at 14 years old we like to have a good time so you know we were the guys friday nights at the parties with the we get beers and do whatever and then you move away from home and guys are older some guys are 20 year olds and junior and there's mm. there's drinking there's going out and that stuff was going on it's just can you understand that that doesn't have to be every night and that, you know, you can kind of pick your spots because the one thing, when you move away from home, you're basically like a little mini pro hockey player, right? Playing for our yeah. junior teams, but you still got to have fun and enjoy life. So that, that was always a part of it for me. It was just, I love hockey and I take it seriously. And I'm going to be in bed the night before the game, but if there's an opportunity to have some fun, then why not do it? But that's the difference. It's just, can you can you keep it to that picking your spots and the Friday nights only and then you know basically just kind of behave because I understood that reputation was big because mm -hmm. if you have a reputation that's that's not that it it could affect your draft status it could affect how many chances somebody gives you it affects everything because I'm sure you understand this more than any everybody in hockey knows everything. It's just like all it takes is for one of your teammates to tell a buddy or tell his agent. And then the agent, it just, it all comes full circle. You can't hide nothing. I know guys about, I know stuff about guys that they have no idea that I know just because everybody in the game, it's a small circle and you just mm -hmm. know someone and you just come across stuff. So I think that's just, you, you see it happen. It's, you know, guys move away from home. They maybe understand that the NHL is maybe not in their future. So they're going to have a, they're going to go down one way. We're going out all the time and doing fun stuff. That was important to them and probably more important than hockey. Maybe not more important, but they just didn't have a problem doing it. As long as you understand that like, that's just not what life's about 24 seven, right? Everybody's entitled to have a good time. Everybody's yep. entitled to do what they want, but getting up for work and doing your thing and whatever you got to do is also important. So I think it was just finding a balance and understanding what was at stake for me and my future. And that's just kind of how I approached it. Is that something at 16 years old, 17 years old that, that you were consciously thinking about? Did you have somebody, um, either a coach or a player on the team that, that pulled you aside and kind of showed you the way, or is this something that you kind of just figured out on your own? Yeah, I think a lot of it was just figuring out. I think one of the abilities I do have is just a, I think the one thing that my parents instilled in me was just like, you're going to make some mistakes in life, but as long as you recognize the right from wrong, but you can carry on basically like that. And it's not hard to figure out when you move away from home and you're basically a semi pro hockey player, you shouldn't be out partying all the time. Right. Mm. Like, especially the games change so much. I don't think guys party whatsoever. It's just, it's all about, it's just 24 seven where it was never really like that. But, um, you just kind of figure it out on your own. Like I said, yeah, I realize that there's there's a time and place. You got a day off on Sunday and there's a game Saturday night or whatever. You can go out and have some fun. But come Sunday, it's game over until the next time comes around. You don't bleed that into Sunday and then Sunday turns into Monday. That, that's a dangerous game. Yeah, and see, and that's, you know, when you're sitting there talking about all these things, when I was in junior, uh, this was me, right? And 
a lot of it uh, at the time to people may have seemed like I was just a bad egg or this. Um, but for me, uh, you know, I had some underlying stuff going on that I didn't really know how to address. Right. And so I think, I think it's, it's just, everyone has their, their challenges. Um, certainly, uh, there's people like myself and I'm not the only one. Um, you can see pictures behind me and all of these hockey, these pictures are all people who have uh, either taken their own life or died of overdose that have played hockey. And there's sadly more that need to go on the wall, ranging from um, minor hockey players to a junior NHL. Some of the, a lot of the stories you're probably familiar with, some you're not. And so, and I, I've been doing a lot of thinking about this, Jeff is like, you know, people want to have, um, somebody to blame, you know, they want to blame hockey, you know, concussions, this, they want to have something to blame. And the more that I've kind of sat back and realized and thought about it is, okay, so people want something to blame. There's some issues, but these are not hockey issues. You know, these are not, we can't directly relate all of uh, my issues to hockey or anything like that. So how do we use hockey as a vehicle to, you know, promote change and and do these sorts of things surrounding these areas? And I'm just kind of curious as to what your take is kind of on the buzz on mental health um, being, you know, that guy who, you know, you grew up uh, the hard nosed era of hockey and uh, you know, it's kind of that, that mentality, like where, where are you at today with kind of, the way we are talking about mental health and hockey and, and taking care of our kind of emotional side as hockey players. I'm just kind of curious if you don't mind answering. Yeah, it's just, it's a great progression than back in the day from playing because you just mentioned you might've been doing things that were maybe different from some of your teammates. Did anyone have the, the understanding to pull you aside and say, Hey, what's up with this? As mm -hmm. opposed to just saying, Oh, there's that guy. He just goes out and he does his thing. And, Back in the day, there was no checking in on a guy saying, hey, like, well, is there something wrong where you're it's causing you to behave like this? That's just mm -hmm. not what we did back then. It was just like, ah, oh, maybe that guy's a little effed up and or, or who knows the scenario. But the, the, the digging into it and, and asking questions never really happened. And I think guys, I can honestly say that guys that, that play in the NHL now, I think they're aware of that type of stuff. They can tell they, they understand their teammates and. I don't think anybody's embarrassed to talk about it anymore as back in the day we might have been like i don't really want to talk to anybody else about that like i like i mentioned the hockey being a small world back in those days maybe if that got out that you had something going on and or an issue it would like filter out to somebody who the hell knows would find out and they would view it as a weakness so mm -hmm. the hockey element of all of that i'm glad things have progressed and, and, you know, and that I'm very much sure that was the case uh, for me, not that it would have changed anything. I think I was on a path of self-destruction anyways. Um, but yeah, and so I, when I think back to being in that position and feeling an immense amount of struggle, living in swift current, away from home, first thoughts of, you know, here I am living out my dream, 16 year old playing in the WHL. And and, and all I can think about is I just want to go home. Like I'm just something, I just don't even want to be here. I don't want to play hockey. Didn't, I didn't understand it. And, um, and you know, my wife has a difficult time understanding that too. I'm uh, 15 and 16 years old. We are moving away from home playing hockey. It's just, she thinks it's crazy. And when you're struggling away from your own home, it's, that must be even times five or 10. Wouldn't it yeah. Be? And so, and so to you, what you were saying is like, here I was, with the mentality, if anybody in the hockey community finds out it's viewed as a weakness. So now I'm going to try to self will my, my way through it. And in, by doing that, now all of these things start to pour out all these, you know, character defects or whatever you want to call them, me acting out and because it's not getting addressed and it, it, you know, it just, it kind of makes me think. And, uh, I, I do think that the game now with the players and, you know, I have quite a few friends who are active players as well. Uh, and, you know, we talk a little bit about this stuff and it seems like it is progressing in that way. I was just kind of curious because when I watch you and, and the way that you played and I mean, you look at the, you know, the picture and, and like you were a, a hard and like you were a goal scorer. Let's not kid around, but you, you played the game a, a hard way too. And it's, you know, and by that, I mean, there was, it was, it was like put up or shut up. I don't care if my eyes swollen shut, literally. I'm going to keep, I'm going to keep playing. <laughs> That's just one of them. That's not even the bad one. Um, That's and, just the way it was back then. I think my yeah. dad taught me at a young age. He was just, you know, just the small town Canadian mentality about hockey where it's like, 
you could be skilled or you can score goals or be the best player on the ice. But I think it was just one of those family lessons where like physical physicality is a part of the game. And I think it, for, for myself and my two brothers, if we didn't play like with an, in some type of intense fashion, I think we'd feel like we're letting our dad down because he just couldn't stand any kind of laziness or lack of intensity, lack of physicality. So I think that's where it all comes from. Well, I think having your brothers probably helped as well. And uh, hockey family, both your brothers played in the Ontario Hockey League as well. And, um, uh, you know, I don't I don't know how to lead into this, but, you know, you suffered a tragic loss. And I just want to say how sorry I am uh, for that. Um, and it just must have been uh, terribly hard uh, for you and the family. And uh, that was when you uh, came to Toronto. And I know yeah. there's people watching the show right now um, that are watching and, and throwing out comments and uh here's an example jeff legend still good enough to get in the maple leafs team watch them choke against the rangers jeff we need you back <laughs> uh so yeah it was great though it was on, honestly a really difficult time for my family but um it was maybe his little blessing for me to come home and because I, I basically said i'm going to go home and see my family and be around my family or i'm not going to play so i got that opportunity so it was a difficult time but I guess the years go on and you just learn to deal with it, right? It's just one of those things where there's no magic potion where it's just all of a sudden awesome and you forget about it. That's never the case. But time goes on, things do get better. Yeah. Um, I'm I, I'm sorry for, for bringing it up. I just felt I had to. You're alluding to your brothers and uh, yeah. you grew up in the hockey family. Your brother was uh, actually the captain of the Peterborough Peets, um, Don O'Neill. So... Uh, you moved to Florida uh, shortly after retiring, and uh, there's no question, Jeff, that you could have kept playing. I look at your numbers, um, and you walked away from the game, and I know you were going through a lot, but I have to ask you, how was it for you uh, leaving the game at, at 31? And, and uh, Couldn't have happened fast enough for me, but yeah? I think everybody kind of leaves the game at a different time, different terms, whether they're the players' terms or just – other terms, facts of life, don't play anymore. Nobody wants to sign you. But I honestly, I think we talked about kind of my, my bio, my background. And it's like, it seemed like hockey was almost a job from like nine years old on. Mm -hmm. And I was like, this, you feel so awful saying it because people love playing men's league. They love it so much. And they think it's just, I don't know. I think they just think it's tons of money and you fly around and score goals and it's easy. It's a grind. There's lots of flights. There's lots of travel. There's lots of stress. There's, it's just not as easy as people think. So I was, I honestly probably could have retired at 28 or 27. It was just, I had, there were some rocky times where I wasn't playing. I didn't know where my career was going. And I honestly, I was just really happy to, when I actually did retire, because this is what I was saying to myself during some tough times, I'm like, I just want to go home and be a regular guy with my buddies. Hmm. Like screw the money, keep the money. I just want to go home and be a regular guy. And I just kind of stuck it out and things turned around. So it was good. <laughs> you know, and I, you know, obviously our careers went totally different directions, but I feel, I still feel that way. Um, you know, I just recently started playing uh, senior men's. Uh, my buddy owns a team and I like, I didn't skate for 10 years, Jeff, you know, homelessness, oh, yeah. jail, drug addiction for 10 years. I was not, I did nothing for 10 years. And so started to play again. And like, I wanted it to be more fun than it was. Like it's full contact. Yeah. It's funny. I got, listen to this. I got jumped. I got jumped my very first game in warm up. In warm up, I've never seen anything like it. They brought some MMA fighter guy in this league. I was like, "Where the hell am I?" Ended up breaking his nose. I did all right, and he messaged me after, and we kind of talked, and ended up we kind of have a similar story too, and it worked out that way. But you know, people, even when I was playing junior and in, in pro, there was times where I felt. Like, how can you not be so grateful to be doing this? How can yeah. you, how can this, because everyone would look at me, even say in junior, uh, I had so many opportunities in junior, like from Dean Chanel, uh, God bless his heart. He was so kind to me and I put him through the ringer, uh, but he, he gave me so many opportunities and I just... Oh man, I just, I, my mind goes wild when I think of all the poor choices that I made back then. Right. Um, and now I'm forgetting what I'm even talking about, Jeff, uh, save me. 
save me. Yeah, it's you know the 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 junior ride is crazy. I mean, it's just, oh, like paying. I said, you go to junior and you get there. It's like you could go down one way and go go down another one, and it's maybe the wrong door. I don't know. I think we all make choices, and it's tough to deal with it afterwards. But yeah, you know, like with them. yeah, I would walk away from you know I walked away from the team because I was legitimately you know, suicidal and, and couldn't control my drink. It just not feeling well. And, uh, you know, leaving the team, it wasn't like an easy decision for me to do by any means. Um, you know, and then having, having people like that, that instantaneously, you know, tarnishes a reputation, right. Uh, right then and there. But I think back to, to those decisions and just, just based on pure, not even understanding what I was feeling. Um, you know what I mean? And the, the, there's quite a few guys, like I just had, a, I've been doing these zoom calls with teams and just kind of sharing my story. Right. Um, and the stories of, of some of the guys that I played with who are no longer here because they overdosed um, or took their own life. My, even one of my coach, my first year in the ECHL, Quinn Van Horlick, uh, you know, he passed away in 2015. I found out, you know, a couple of years ago too, uh, intentional overdose. And, I just think, just think to all these guys and and girls that we've lost, and and doing these talks with the teams, I realize that there's a lot of suffering going on, and it's again, it's not a hockey problem. I just have the opportunity to to greet hockey players and be a part of their lives. Um, it's uh, it's kind that's of that's the part. That's the problem, Brad I, or Brady. I I, I kind of struggle with because you see some guys get their they're getting into trouble when their career's over and they're like, well, I blame it on that hockey. Mm. And it's like, okay, I can understand if you got screwed over by some doctor and he put you on the ice and you were concussed and he knew and you didn't know. I mean, that's a screw job. That's hockey screwing with people's lives. But I find there's some other times, as you mentioned, guys, it's just something goes wrong in their life. It's like, oh, that damn hockey, man. Mm. I get all that shit. And, and I always say to myself, I played with guys that had concussions and maybe they're every, every concussions are always good, but there's just a, a lot of guys that dealt with health problems that came out of it on the other end. But mm -hmm. it just seems like when something goes south, somebody's like, Oh, that game of hockey. And mm -hmm. I drank so much because I played hockey or I got into drugs because I played hockey. I'm like, sometimes there's just a human element where you just got yep. into that on your own and hockey had nothing to do with it. Absolutely. And that's, and that's where I'm at too. And like, I don't know if you're familiar, I'm sure you are, you must be familiar with this class action lawsuit against the CHL, um, you know, for concussions and there's another one for this. And, you know, so being a former player being, you know, suffered a few concussions and some of my friends and, and former guests of the show are part of this lawsuit. And so I wanted to do my due diligence. And this is the first time that I'm actually sharing this part of it on the show, because as people have, you've been watching or listening, you kind of been following us along talking about this and, uh, you know, I took a meeting uh, with the lawyers that are, are taking it on and because purely I wanted to get information, you know, like I just wanted to know what was going on. And so, you know, I share my story and then I get the call back. They're like, we want to take you on as a client. And I'm like, yeah, no, I'm calling my dad first. And I talked to my dad. I'm like, this is not, this is not, this is not a, this is not a solution. Us blaming or looking for money, like me getting money because of this, it's not going to fix me or fix what's going on. I said, this is my, it's not, I don't know. Like, I just feel like this is not the right route where there could be more of a, a solution based. And again, it's, it is, and I'm not saying that these guys shouldn't do it or should do it. I think everyone's entitled to their own opinion. But again, there's a lot of people out there, like you said, that are using hockey as sort of the scapegoat. And of course, there's going to be situations where that may be the case. Um, but again, it's always the woulda, coulda, shoulda. And I, you know, part of my painkiller addiction stemmed from an injury in hockey where the doctors gave me Oxycontin and whatever. But prior to that, I was already, you know, I had already dabbled in other stuff. So I don't, I don't blame the hockey culture or hockey for, for my addiction issues by any means. I blame it on the trauma that I suffered as a kid, right? And if I didn't have hockey, Jeff, I would have been dead a long time ago. And where the hell would I be today? I wouldn't be having this conversation. I don't have this podcast and I'm not two years clean come February 8th here in 10 days. So 
I'm with you on that one. Hockey to me is is the solution. It is not the game of hockey or this or that. I think there's changes to be made, but if there's anything else that you would want to say on that, I would love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, I think you basically covered it. It's like obviously the the game of hockey and they're all they're like – the big thing is when somebody gets hurt, what, what what's coming out of the bottle for the trainers? Like it's sometimes you get hurt and you got to take a painkiller or I don't mm-hmm. know. I didn't, I used an ice bag and a cold beer on the bus. I didn't really get into that, but it's like some guys get hooked on it and then they find other avenues to get it. And that's outside of the rink. But I mean, I don't know it it's everywhere. because every trainer I've had always was in the best interest of the player. Me too. I never had I never had a single trainer anywhere. I'm not one of those guys that says trainer this, trainer that. In fact, I will tell you that uh, you know, when I got these pills, I was could have they tried the doctor was like, Hey, you don't need them anymore. And I just kept telling them that I would needed them longer because I liked the way they made me feel emotionally, not that I needed them anymore for my knee injury. And then so that's on, you know, that's on me. I I think the trainers, uh, especially nowadays, I mean, like I I had Paul Ayotte as a trainer in Swift Current. He's with the the Leafs there. And like a, the guy is just remarkable, like just yeah. a great human See, being. See, that's what bugs me because I know that yeah. some trainers have been kind of so-called blamed or it's and I know that they're just really good people. I'm not just guessing that. I actually know that that yeah. they were doing their thing and doing what they were asked by the player, and all of a sudden, all of a sudden, the trainers, you know, you, the bad you know guy. That's the you, one thing I don't like. Do you know what I found, Jeff? Is that I, I, through stories that I've heard, it's not typically been the trainer of a team it's been a trainer of the like an off ice trainer uh you know somebody like that in a gym or i've heard this story like five or six times in the last year some guy in a gym though just have access to write prescriptions i don't i don't you'd be surprised you'd be very surprised but um i've you know, for example, there was a guy in, in rehab uh, not too long ago, and I have no idea where he is today. Unfortunately, I can't find him, but that was his story, right? And um, and there's there's another one. There's a couple more of those stories where they're no longer here today. And, uh, you know, I talked to their family members. But, again, it's never – I don't hear a lot of it coming directly from, from you know, junior or pro trainers. So how much time do we have, Jeff? I know you're a busy guy. You got your kids, and do you still skiing on the weekends, or what the hell are you doing? Oh, yeah, I try to ski on my weekends, but I got a couple of minutes here. I try to ski on the weekends. I started snowboarding with my wife, and I got my, excuse me, I got my kids into snowboarding and skiing. So I joined this fancy membership in Collingwood, which is an hour north of our, our cottage. is like an hour and a half north of here. And then they did it for one year, and then it's like, nah, no thanks. So Do you ever see Scott Thornton up there at all? I do a lot. Yeah, I was supposed to. I'll probably see him this weekend. Yeah, I was supposed to go up there for he had this big dirt bike thing or uh, that thing. Yeah, he wanted, dirt bikes, man. yeah, he wanted me. He wanted me to come up there, and uh, yeah, he's a, he's been on the show. He's a great guy, man. He's yeah, a great guy, and uh, yeah, authority. Yeah, I'm in. Uh, I'm in Gravenhurst actually. I'm not. Oh, uh, are you? Good yeah, stuff. yeah, I'm in. I'm in Gravenhurst. In between Gravenhurst and Huntsville weekends, and then during the week here, but. Yeah, it's uh, it's a great spot. Obviously, I'm from BC, but I'm sure sure enjoying the the beautiful Muskoka outdoor rinks. I'll tell you that much. I never had that as a kid, and I'm just soaking it up like crazy. It's beautiful up there, man. You get any time of year if you can handle the cold. It's there's no better place than up there in Muskoka, man. Yeah, I'm still uh, I'm still waiting. Brad May texted me a couple weeks ago and was like, "Hey, I've been at my cottage all winter." He's like, "Let's get together for coffee." And I'm I'm just waiting for the right time to be like, "So, do you have a rink on the front of your your cottage?" It probably doesn't. She probably wants nothing to do with hockey. <laughs> but but there's a lot of uh, a great great people up here, and uh, yeah, just a beautiful beautiful spot. Do you ever get up here at all? Do you golf up here? I lived up there for ten years in the summertime. Whereabouts? I love it. Now uh, the golf, what's that? Where, like, oh, you, you're not up here anymore, though. You're no, in- I sold my cottage about ten years ago. But I love it. I gotta know. I gotta know where it was. It was in uh, Hamer Bay on uh, Lake Joe. Lake Joe, nice. Yeah, that's yeah. what. Yeah, about an, a kilometer, a kilometer north of where the Lake Joe Club was. Yeah, 
Yeah, it's a beautiful spot. I don't think it gets yeah, any nice. Yeah. It doesn't really get any nicer in, in Canada. Um, yeah, man, listen, I don't. Uh, I would keep you all night if I could, but I know your time's all. You probably got hockey games to watch. I don't know what's going yeah. on in the two, but uh, listen, I, I honestly, man, from the bottom of my heart, I really, really appreciate your time, and, and uh, I know you didn't have to do this. Uh, we got a ton of comments coming in, guys. I'm going to get to them after we let Jeff go. We'll... Uh, We'll, uh, we'll let him get back to his job here. And uh, we, we just appreciate you joining Hockey to Hell and Back, man, and uh, be watching you all the time. All right, Brady. Thanks a lot, bud. Anytime. We'll do it again soon. Thanks, man. Have a good one. All right, guys. That's Jeff O'Neill from TSN. That was a great conversation. Great conversation. Um, I'm going to wrap this show up in a few minutes. We'll take it away. We'll take it away to our friends at Pride Tape. See you guys in a minute. Hockey to Hell and Back is brought to you by Pride Tape. Pride Tape is a badge of support from teammates, coaches, parents, and pros to young LGBTQ players. It shows every player that they belong playing the sport they love and that we're all on the same team. Show your support for teammates, coaches, and fans in the LGBTQ community by wrapping your stick with Pride Tape. Every roll of tape will make an impact in sports and beyond. Inclusion starts with leadership. Check out some of the ideas of how you can get involved at youcanplayproject.org. Check out Pride Tape at pridetape.com. For more information, you can send an email to aubrey at pridetape.com. That's A-U-B-R-E-E, Aubrey, at PrideTape.com. You can find Pride Tape on Facebook.com slash Pride Tape, on Twitter at Pride Tape, and at Pride Tape on Instagram. Pride Tape thanks all of you for being champions for change. Thank you to our friends at Pride Tape. Guys, I'm going to rip through the comments. Thanks for watching. But a lot of people watching tonight, if you're if you're watching or if you're listening after the fact, thank you. If you're listening on audio right now, thank you so much. If you're watching right now on YouTube, can you please press that like? Please press that subscribe. Maybe even the notification bell. Isn't that what the kids tell, tell us to do these days? I think that's what the kids tell us to do. If you're watching on Facebook... If you could be so kind to scoot over to YouTube and subscribe to the Hockey to Hell and Back YouTube channel, that would also be greatly, greatly appreciated. I thank you all uh, for being a, a part of this journey. If this is your first time watching, thank you. If you're one of the many who've been following along since virtually day one, I love you guys. Honestly, I don't know where I am today without this show. I have other things now aside from this show, but it all started right here. It all started right here, and I'm just super grateful for all of you. Uh, so let me rip through the comments real quick. Matthew Means are down there in Argentina. What's up, Matt? Michelle Alt up there in South Dundas. Erica Lynn down in Barrie, Matt Thompson's sister. What's up, Erica? My guy Brody is with him today. I'm going to get to some pictures at the end, too. He's already all over it, telling people to go to YouTube. Thanks, Brody. David Grass, old dog in the house. Well, he was. Brody Kerbison says, what a beast. Rick Sterling in the house. What's up, Rick? Coach Cam and family. What's up, guys? Austin Smith is watching, says, watched him as a kid in Greensboro, North Carolina. Go Canes. Shane King Condera, wish I got to see Jeff play for the Leafs. Lucas Hicks. Hey, oh dog, huge Leafs fan. Thanks for all the memories with the Leafs. Brady, love you, man. Keep rocking, boys. What's up, Lucas? How are you, man? Thanks for watching. Jeff, we got to that one. Thanks for watching, Jeff. Stuart Gershman, good point, O-Dog. Players need to buddy check one another. Yes, yes, yes. I got to... <laughs> buddy check one another. Buddy check one another. That's a that's a play on words to uh, buddy check for Jesse. 
Jesse Anders Short Gershman tragically took his own life um, and his family out there in the great province of British Columbia is doing some amazing work. And as of yesterday, it is buddy check week. So check in on your friends, check in on your buddies and make sure you go check out buddy check for Jesse's. That was a lot of checks, but honestly, great cause. We're going to hopefully be doing some stuff with them. Uh, puck support, buddy check for Jesse coming together. Any and all aligned organizations and people that want to be part of the solution and aren't in competition for anything. Let's go. Let's get together. Let's actually make a difference. Let's save some lives. There's no competition here. I'm we're all in on for puck support. We're all in for working with anybody with the aligned or similar views or causes that want to make a difference. And that's what it's all about. And I know buddy check for Jesse is just that check them out on Instagram, buddy check for Jesse. My guy, Dylan watching Kristen down there in the six Taylor's cousin. How are you? We got Josh Balderson up there in Kingston, Ontario. Hey, Jeff, love your style of broadcasting. What's up, Josh? That's right, Lucas, you are a trainer. Sean says, great job, Brady. Thank you, Sean. And my guy, Dean Smeal, top bunk, out there in St. Paul, Alberta. Hello, Dino. Let's catch up on a phone call. We did a couple days ago, but always love talking to you. Thanks for watching, everybody. If you're watching again, please like, subscribe, turn on that notification bell. If I ever say that again, somebody yell at me. I hate when people say that, but I guess hopefully it works. Check out Puck Support, pucksupport.com. Follow us on social media at Puck Support. Check out the new hoodie, maroon. Not just available in Pain is Real, but so is Hope now in the Puck Support. Just show you quick who I got. This is the very first hoodie like this. I didn't even press it. My friend Doug pressed it, by the way. And. He pressed Daniel Miner in it. I'm not sure if Michelle and Tom, Lindsay or Haley are watching, but love you guys. Always remembering Daniel and all those that we've lost here. That's pretty much it. That's pretty much it. Happy birthday, dad. Love you. Shout out to all my family back home. Honestly, I can't even talk about it. I start to cry. I miss you guys. I really want to get home. I really want to introduce you to the new additions to the family. Um, yeah thank you to Jeff O'Neill stay tuned for the announcement stay tuned to the announce for the announcement hopefully Thursday if you bear with me here on this live show for a second I can tell you if he's there you go Chris Versteeg Thursday 12 noon Eastern Chris Versteeg joining Hockey to Hell and Back, two-time Stanley Cup champion, owner, founder of the Clever app. If you haven't seen that on Instagram and all social media platforms, go to the App Store, download Clever. It's unbelievable. If you're a coach, don't miss the show on Thursday. We're going to talk all about his hockey career and all about this new app and how it can help you as a coach, not just in hockey. So I do see... Uh, I do see a Lucas RIP CS8 Carter Schooner word. If I have anything to do with it, every single one of these hockey players that we've lost will never ever be forgotten. But we're gonna need we're gonna need an army to find solutions so that these stories don't continue to happen. See you guys all on Thursday, twelve noon with Chris Versteeg. Until then, guys, be kind. 
always stay grateful. And I challenge you all tomorrow. I already did today once on social media, but tomorrow go out and do something kind for somebody in need. It doesn't have to be monetary. It could be something small, something big. It doesn't matter. Do something, be of service. And once you've done that, shoot me a message. I'm curious as to how many people will get back to me and say, hey, yeah, accepted the challenge. Then you know what you do? You challenge other people to do the same thing and we create a trickle down effect. Anyways, guys, that's it. See you on Thursday. Have a great day. If you so choose. I don't want no fake love, I want the real stuff Everybody listen up, cause I'll only say it once I'm gonna show you all the path, if you want it bad I'm gonna show you every side, yeah, how you can get it back Yeah, cause I ain't never done, I'll be number one Working hella hard until I get just what I want, yeah Rise just like the sun, yeah, fatal like a gun Shooter's gonna shoot and I'm gonna shoot until I fall I'm yeah. always do it on my own, so I gotta get through it And the only thing I know is to love what I'm doing Never give up, never slow till I finally prove it Never listen to the no's, I just wanna keep moving Yeah, I put out all this art, it's my only medicine, yeah Everything I do, I'm just being genuine Yeah, I'm sick of being screwed, feel my own adrenaline Yeah, I do just what I do, and I hope you let me in, let me in, yeah I'm grateful, oh yeah, able, oh yeah, I'm stable, oh yeah, no playful.